Hello, my name is Michael Manatskanyan, and I'm the creator of this Subject to Real Estate Investment Calculator, as well as many other real estate investing calculators and personal finance tools. So today what we're going to do is we're going to practice underwriting a real deal that was brought to me by a wholesaler. Um, this one is a straight subject to transaction, which means once we pay the cash to the seller, all that's remaining is the loan, the existing loan on the property that we're taking over subject to. So let's go into it. This property is one in Yuma, Arizona. It's a two bedroom, one bath property, and it is 1336 square feet. So this is some of the information you're gonna need to know about your property. I mean, at least just to understand some general information about it. Um, next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the information provided by the wholesaler and we're gonna see, do we have all the information that we need? So for a subject to transaction, I've listed some of the um, information that you need, what is necessary to underwrite and then what is nice to have. So you definitely want, you need to know the purchase price. That's gonna be the first thing we're gonna list in there. The subject to loan amount. So how much loan are you taking over? What is the loan amount that you're taking over? Ideally, you wanna know the interest rate, original balance of the loan, first payment date and the amortization terms so that you can see so that you can put the loan terms, the existing loan terms into the sub two payment schedule. So you can see uh, the amortization schedule for that, for the existing loan, even though you're coming into it, let's say a year or two after um, the loan was originated. You know the current PITI or the mortgage payment, which is the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. You wanna know if there are any arrears, if there's any loan payments that need to get um, paid off. And then entry costs. How much do you have to pay the seller? How much cash do you have to pay the seller at closing? What is the wholesaler's assignment fee? Is there an agent involved? Do you have to pay them as well? So this is all just sample data in here. So let's start going through it. This is the information that was provided. So we know the total price, the purchase price is 196273.85. Put 196273.85. And then we know the sub two loan that we're taking over is listed right here. 171273.85. So this doesn't say how much cash we're paying to the seller, but it does say the entry fee is $25,000. So what we need to do is Oh, well, there you go. This purchase price already includes the wholesaler's assignment fee um, is, is what this is implying. If the entry fee is 25,000, that plus the loan balance equals the total price. The assumption is the wholesaler is making something and that's already priced into the, um, into the calculator. So what we're gonna do now, I'm gonna erase a lot of this stuff. We'll keep the closing cost. We'll estimate the rehab later. It doesn't look like there's any agent commission that wasn't listed anywhere. I believe this is a direct to seller deal. And the down payment, instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say this purchase is 186, and we're gonna assume the wholesaler is getting a $10,000 assignment fee, which is fairly standard for creative finance transactions. 5,000, 7,500, 10,000, sometimes up to 15 or 20,000, it really depends on the deal. But for standard transactions, it's around $10,000. So what we'll assume is that the seller is getting $15,000 and, and the wholesaler is getting $10,000 and we still have that $25,000. Those are the assumptions you have to make unless you ask the wholesaler and get clarification. Can you please break down what the 25,000 covers? What we're assuming is it's covering the down payment to the seller, no agent involved, and then there's $10,000 to the um, wholesaler. At the end of the day, it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, you want the total amount correct for your cash on cash return analysis to, um, you need your entry cost to be correct. And then for the sake of, for the sake of cash flow, it's not going to matter because you're subject to loan, the monthly payments are already fixed. It doesn't matter how much you're giving the seller and all that. So if you're a little off, if it's 10,000 to sell and 15,000 assignment fee, it's not going to make any substantial difference, but it is good to know. So you know, um, how to, what you can potentially renegotiate with the seller. So with the seller or the wholesaler. So if you don't have the original loan info, which we do not hear, you can just exclude this. This section helps you calculate what the monthly loan payment is. If you don't have this, there's nothing you can do about it. So the one thing you can do is you can overwrite the principal and interest here if you have a mortgage statement. So let's go and look at a mortgage statement. And here is the mortgage statement. 
it says the interest rate is 3.875. You can still include as much info as you have in here. Just understand that this, this code is not gonna work because you're not gonna know the original loan amount. You'd have to get that information from elsewhere, either asking the seller directly, or um, you can look it up on various software. We're not gonna get into that today. The loan balance, 171, 273, Yep, that's what we saw earlier. This is as of 2-7-2024. So hopefully there was another mortgage payment that was made. So it's actually a little bit less. Otherwise, you'd have to pay that mortgage payment at closing. It shows, let's see. It's limited in the info this one shares, but let's see if I can zoom in further. Okay, so maturity date 10, 2051. Most loans are 30 years. So we can assume that this was, um, if it's 10, uh, what was it? 10, 2051, we'll assume that the loan was originated 10, 1, 2021, because that's 30 years um, prior to the loan amount. So the one, Bad part here is the subject to payment schedule or amortization schedule will utilize the information you have there. But when this monthly payment is overwritten, it's going to change things up, but it will still give you a pretty good, um, pretty good estimation of the amortization schedule. But the problem is you, you don't have the original loan amount to link in here. That is going to be really important for you to have this amortization schedule. So if you decide to move forward with this deal, right, this doesn't really affect the deal so much, but if you decide to move forward with the deal, you're going to want to know the amortization uh, you're going to want to know the original loan amount for the sake of tracking your amortization schedule correctly. So we'll just leave this at 200000 for now. Um, and then let's see the monthly loan payment. So the monthly loan payment, the total monthly loan payment we see in here, it says 1132.95. So I'll write that on the side. But remember, your monthly loan payment, the loan itself is the principal and interest. This is your PITI. So this includes your taxes and insurance as well. So you're going to want to separate those out. Let me see if on the mortgage statement, we could do that pretty well. Really, the tax and insurance are an escrow. So you separate out the escrow payment um, respective, or you separate the escrow payment and the remainder is the principal and interest. It's really hard to see with the mortgage statement that was provided. And actually one thing I'm noticing is there's an $11,000, over $11,000 reinstatement that needs to get paid. So maybe that's part of this. Maybe the seller is actually not getting any of the money and all of the money that's listed in there is going to arrears and liens. Once again, that doesn't drastically change anything because your entry cost will still be the same. However, what that does change is if you were going to try to negotiate the seller's commission or the sellers, um, the cash to the seller down. Well, if it's arrears and liens, you can't really do that. You have to pay that back anyway. So we'll need to get further clarification of this something you decide to move forward with. So we see here is escrow payments of, it really doesn't say. So for the sake of this, we're going to assume of the 1130. So if the loan was 2000, this payment would be around 940, 47. So let's just estimate the taxes and insurance is somewhere between these two. So the taxes and insurance or TI is 192.48. For a small single family home in Arizona, let's say it's the insurance here is around $80. So equals 80 times 12. We're gonna assume this is the right amount for the monthly loan payment. And the difference is your taxes and, ins taxes and insurance. These numbers might be wrong. However, you're still gonna have the same monthly PITI that you should have anyway. So, you know, that part stays the same. What can happen is that the sale, depending on your insurance and taxes could go up um, because the property might be reassessed at your new purchase price and insurance might be higher depending on if their insurance is a owner occupied homeowner and you're an investor. So, so we've got the $80 there. So we're gonna do equals that minus 80. So we're gonna estimate $112 a month in taxes. That seems really low to me. So I would definitely wanna check if there is 
if there's anything that you should be considering on there in regards to maybe a homestead exemption or something that's reduced their tax liability, we're not going to get into that. We're just going to worry about underwriting in this calculator today. So let's get rid of, there's no, since it's a single family home, typically the landlord's not paying for any of those utilities. There's still a 10% property management um, that you're setting aside. And then you're setting aside 18% for reserves, which are 8% for vacancy and 10% for maintenance and CapEx. Maintenance being just routine work that needs to get done. You need to send a plumber out, stuff like that. Capital expenditures being the savings that you need to save up um, for like the roof replacement, appliances, bigger, bigger, saving, uh, bigger expense that you need to save up for. So at this point, you have your sub two loan calculations. You have the purchase price, your sub two loan amount you're taking over, the down payment, which remember we clarified it could be part of it is the reinstatement or paying back the arrears on the property. Original loan amount, 200,000 is our estimation, all the loan terms that were provided. And your first payment date would be 4-1-2024 because it, it stated that the, that the closing date was at the end of March, 2024. So you'd be paying the next uh, mortgage payment, which would be 4-1-2024. And so we have our, oh, for income, it says between 1,500 and 1,600 for a long-term rental. So let's put that, this is a, two bed, one bath, and this is uh, 1,500 rental income. Let's say market rent, once it's renovated, could be 1,750 or whatever. We're not gonna go into comps and getting rental comps. We're just plugging numbers into the calculator and understanding how that works. So, sub two balloon, there was no mention of a balloon. So I would just set that as, if this loan is due in 2051, it's 2020, 2051 and it's 2024 now, there's 27 more years till the loan, like the loan will be fully paid off by then. So you could just put 28, whatever. It's not gonna matter if you exceed the loan term, it's not gonna matter. So I'll just put the full 30 years and it'll show you what the total amount of interest and principal you would have paid, not the, for the total loan balance. For the total loan balance, the total interest would be here, right? It would be the 30 years worth of interest, oops, which is $138,570. But this shows you, so that's 138.5. This shows you for yourself, you're going to only pay 121 because you're purchasing the property subject to the existing loan. You're taking over in the middle of someone's amortization schedule. They are the ones who already paid a portion of that interest and the principal down for you. And then property tax estimator, we're not going to get into that now, but the idea is if the current property value at the time of, so this is the property value um, that is assessed. So let's say we saw on Zillow, it said it was assessed at 170,000 and the taxes were 1350, right? That's what we listed here. And you're buying it at 186,000. Your taxes will be approximately $1,477 assuming this millage rate is correct for that um, for that location, right? You'd have to go to Yuma, Arizona County website and get some info on how they assess property taxes. So let's see how this works. You have your entry costs. We're gonna look at photos to estimate rehab real fast. So let's look at the photos and estimate rehab and see what condition it's in, whether it's turnkey and needs 500 or $1,000 for general cleaning, it needs a light renovation, maybe flooring, maybe a little paint, medium if you need to change some things around structurally, maybe redo the kitchen or bathroom. Okay, so definitely needs a deep cleaning. You see like little damage here, little, pretty outdated looking kitchen. I mean, the flooring could stay. You could put LVP on it, but it might not be worth it. Everything's painted really ugly. Um, like you'd probably want to repaint a lot of this or maybe not everything, but this black cabinets and all that looks like they didn't maybe prime it initially. This is pretty bad. So it looks like there might be some electrical work for you to do. I don't know. It'd be something to double check. So this is your initial analysis before you go into the deep analysis. If you decided something you want to proceed with, I don't know what's going on here. Um, it's weird. So there's a decent amount of work to be done here. At minimum, painting everything, almost everything. You're gonna wanna clean up this yard a little bit. 
I don't know what that is. Maybe a, oh, a little shed. Okay. So at minimum, I, I don't feel comfortable putting anything less than maybe 15K for this. Primarily painting, drywall, potential electrical issues. But a lot of it is definitely cosmetic. Um, painting, which is walls and cabinets. Okay, so what we're gonna see here is that for the analysis section, you've done what you need to. For the analysis section, you're gonna see the income is 1500, expenses are 1133, property management costs are 150, and your reserves are 270. Assuming this is true, your monthly cash flow is negative $53 a month. So you're losing $53 a month. However, you do have 270 going to reserves each month. So that's why down here, I also state, what would be the cash flow if you didn't save any reserves? Basically, this is your kind of worst case scenario or what you'd anticipate, you know, if you had to use all your reserves and property management, all that, all those extra costs. And this is what it would be if you didn't have to do that. I like to see, personally, I like to see this closer to 20%. And I like to see my, um, or my cash flow, uh, several hundred dollars, as well as my cash on cash return. What is your annual cash flow divided by your entry cost? I like to see that closer to 10%. I like to see the cash flow around $100 a month minimum and my cash on cash return closer to 10%. So it, for me, these are no deals. You can change these goals to whatever makes sense for you. Maybe you just want it to be cash flow neutral and just $0. Maybe you only need a 5% or 20% cash on cash return. You can edit that out. The net operating income is your income minus your expenses without accounting for any loan payments. So this is going to be a lot higher. And then you have your cap rate and expense to rent ratio. We don't get into the weeds on those, but once again, it's your cash flow and cash on cash return with with full reserves accounted for, cash flow and cash cash return without reserves. And so there's additional analysis. So although you may not get high cash on cash return, oh, so this market rent is what you put, what you project you can get it to rent at if you increase the value of the property and got it in a nice condition. So this is saying if you did get it at seventeen fifty your cash on cash return would actually be 3.2%. And this shows you over a one year, five year, 10 year and 20 year horizon, what your returns would look like, your cash on cash return and your return on investment down here. If you were to use a private money partner, a partner who's bringing the $47,000 to close on the property, you give them partial ownership in this instance, 32%, but you give them majority of cash flow, what would their returns look like? And this basically shows you what their returns would look like, but this is assuming the 1750 market rent. If you want to see it at, exist, at the existing market rent, you want to make sure to have this um, be included in there. But remember, you're doing almost $15,000 of rehab to improve the property. So you should theoretically be increasing the, the rent. So this shows you what it would look like for your private money partner, one year, five year, 10 year, and 20 year. This shows you both of your returns. If you have someone else covering it all, obviously your returns are going to be infinite. This shows you if you use a private money lender instead, if this thing is in cash flow without private money, uh, without a private money loan, it's definitely not going to cash flow with, with one. And this shows you what could you do potentially to reduce the price, it which would theoretically then reduce the cash or pain of the seller. And what would the returns look like in that scenario? It seems like it doesn't really make much of a difference because this thing is negative cash flow. It's not going to get any better just because you reduce the price because the loan amount is still the same. And this is if you wanted to implement different strategies because this is a two bedroom, one bath house. I don't anticipate this working too well, but you can do a rent by the room model, pad split, short-term rental and an, or a midterm rental. What you can do is estimate it costs $20,000 for furnishing, increasing your entry cost, your short-term rental income, let's just use theirs is 2,500. You still have your taxes. You're gonna pay maybe an additional $500 in utilities. You're gonna have to pay your property managers more money same maintenance and capital expenditures, this shows you you'd be negative $8 short-term rental cash flow. And so it still wouldn't make sense, especially if you're doing a short-term rental, investing more money, you want higher cash flow and higher cash on cash return. So once again, this tab, you got your entry costs, rental income, your loan expenses, the balloon, 
as well as all of the analysis first year, as well as first, first, fifth, 10th, and 20 year analysis, what it would look like if you use a private money partner and what it would look like if you use a private money lender. And almost all of that is auto calculated once you just fill out this top portion. This is if you really wanna understand how everything's broken down over a 30 year cycle, right? Once your loan is paid off, you're gonna end up making a lot more cash flow, but it's gonna be, you know, 28 years from now. And then your full amortization 